Right now, generally speaking, in Western society, we find ourselves in a position to where we have several institutions that control a tremendous amount of power within Western society. Now, that might not seem like anything crazy because the reality is most westernized people are absolutely used to this fact, but it actually is a problem if you think about it longer than two seconds. Why is it that we find ourselves in a position right now to where several institutions literally hoard and control a vast amount of resources? And I don't just mean resources in the sense of like gold and silver or whatever. I'm talking about human psychological resources as well. Now, the issue that we immediately run into and that we have to face before we go further and so that, you know, the rest of this show will make sense anyways, is the fact that all of these institutions which control the amount of power that they do were never elected by the people to be in these positions, which is hilarious and ironic if you think about it for more than two seconds. Because what has happened is, is that while everybody has been obsessed with democracy, there's been an entire other system that supersedes democracy and also completely separates itself from that concept. And that would be the concept, of course, of, you know, companies. And these companies have been allowed to get so huge that they essentially wield the exact same, if not more, power than your average country. And then, of course, you know, the host countries to where these companies have latched on to, they have their own representatives, lobbyists, which go and tell the politicians and the leaders of said country what to do. And, and this is just normal nowadays, right? Everything I just said is not some sort of weird conspiracy theory. It's not crazy stuff. You can literally right now go see it happening right in front of your face. We can scientifically prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that this is the situation that we find ourselves today in the West. Now, it gets even funnier because if you think about it, they, they keep throwing out that word normalized because what they've done is they've normalized the concept of companies wielding that kind of power, right? The same kind of power that a country would wield. I mean, we literally do have companies nowadays hiring private armies. What, what, what's the difference between a country and a company at this point, right? A company essentially has tons of resources. It has tons of people under them. It has its own damn army. And it literally might as well be engaging in diplomatic missions with other countries, right? acting as if they're their own entity of power that cannot be messed with, or that is an entity of power that is at the same level as the country's core leadership, right? And if you, I mean, the reality is no company should really be able to have any kind of control whatsoever when it comes to political agendas, but that is all we see nowadays. And of course, like I said earlier, this stuff has been normalized. Oh, and by the way, really fast, just so everybody understands this concept or this key word, this key trigger word of normalization is quite literally textbook psychological conditioning. Right now, you can go witness it with your own eyes. You can watch companies and your government trying to coerce you psychologically into normalizing something that they want to do that is technically against your best interest. Normalization is indeed psychological programming. Just in case anybody hasn't figured that out or they were wondering, yes, you're correct. That is literally what is going on. What's even more funny with this kind of psychological programming is that this programming is not disguised. They actually literally say, we are going to change the way you think and we are going to normalize whatever the hell they're trying to normalize. That is psychological conditioning, and that is base, basic level, you know, bare, bare bones psychological conditioning, but they're doing it. They are literally programming everybody right in front of their own faces, and to make it worse, they're getting away with it. So if anybody ever thinks that a company or a government would not go out of their way to psychologically condition people to do something that is against their best interest, all you have to go do right now is log on to any social media, any mainstream news site, whatever, it doesn't matter, and then we're done. We've scientifically proven it. 
right? So basically what we've done is we have given companies the ability to psychologically control entire populations. Where the hell did this power come from? Now, I'm kind of ranting. This is not going to be about companies and stuff like that. We're going to get into the other side of the power structure, the other side of the, the corrupt, unearned power structure, and that would be the structure of religious rule. And, and more to the point in what we're going to talk about today, it's going to be the Vatican situation. Because right now, we have a huge, powerful institution, a religious institution, that was born, you know, technically, you know, a thousand plus years ago or whatever they want to state right now. But anyways, we have a religious institution that wields not only a tremendous amount of psychological power, which is probably the most, you know, I think you could probably argue that psychological power or psychological control is more important than physical control. I think we can easily make that argument. And in fact, I'm not even going to argue it. I'm just going to make that claim. Anyways, they have that kind of power over a significant portion of the planet, right? Now, you might also be saying, yeah, but bro, I don't believe in God. I don't, you know, I don't believe in Catholicism and Christianity or, or whatever, you know, whatever Abrahamic religion they're pushing today. That's fine. But here's the reality. You do not have to be a believer in the religion which has that kind of power to be affected by the psychological programming that they are currently executing. It doesn't matter. So long as you even know of the existence of something like the Bible, you have already been affected by the programming. Now, I get it. You're saying right now, but I don't believe in the Bible, dude. Like, I'm, I'm way above all that. I'm an atheist. I've got it all figured out. Well, have you ever stopped to think that maybe even that mindset might be some form of psychological programming? Most atheists don't think like this because, unfortunately, you're, and this is like the militant atheist. I'm not talking about the standard atheist who doesn't care. You know what? They're, they're normal people. That's fine. I'm talking about the militant atheist, the militant atheist who thinks that they are above everything simply because they have not bought in to the lies or whatever of religion, right? That's not how that works. And in fact, that can very easily and has been easily turned against the atheist population. All right, I'm, you know, okay, I know, I'm still rambling. All right, so what's the point of all this? My main point is, is that right now we find ourselves in a position on the, on the world stage. This is not a local situation or just in the West. What we find is we find that there is a religious institution with a tremendous amount of power, so much power, by the way, that they are able to influence essentially almost all governments on this planet should they want to. Now, I get it. You might be saying, well, you know, they can't influence Islamic governments and stuff like that. But to that, I would say, do you really know exactly what's going on behind the scenes? I mean, do you really have the proof of exactly what is happening? And of course, the answer is no. Because the reality is, anything that is truly messed up, any, any sort of real true power grab that is made that gains like really huge amounts of control, you are probably not going to be made aware of any of this stuff taking place. You are only going to feel the after effects. That, that's generally what's going to happen. You are not going to be told what's going on. And I realize that sometimes they do tell you what's happening, but the reality is, at the end of the day, this stuff is going on behind closed doors. Okay, I know, I'm just ranting now about garbage. Okay, main point here is, is that we find ourselves with the Vatican being in a position of power who can influence governments, companies, you know, societies, etc. And this would be independent of whether or not you believe in their ideology. You don't have to believe in their ideology to be affected, right? And that's just the scientific fact. There's no way out of it, right? And I know, I, you know, you're probably wondering why I always talk about the psychological stuff whenever we're talking about history. I, I cannot stress enough how important it is to understand or to have a basic understanding of a real human psychology and what humans are truly capable of. Because if you don't have that, you're going to see stuff in history that won't make sense for the simple reason that you believe that a human would never do that, right? That, that is literally how people 
will write off certain recorded events is they believe no no human would ever do that come on that's like a bedtime story or whatever that is literally how people will write off potential re <clears throat> that is literally how people write off historical events just because they believe that it is not possible it must not be possible so for example we find ourselves in a position to where we have a religious institution with a tremendous amount of power and this power doesn't just spread into say politics or even like the corporate level no it spreads even into the darker areas of humanity and we also know this is a scientific fact as well right so i'm not going to get into all the crazy dark stuff but if we are going to make any kind of an effort to try and piece together a real chronology a real human chronology one of the darker aspects that we have to acknowledge is that there are indeed institutions on this planet which were not elected by the public, which were not agreed upon really in any sense of the word by the public to allow these institutions to have the kind of control that they currently exercise. So basically what I just said is that right now your life is being affected by people who have no right whatsoever to affect your life. To make matters even worse, the reality is the vast majority of people on this planet realize what's going on to one extent or another. But isn't it interesting that the people never rise up and take down these institutions which are generally objectively a net negative on society. Instead of all of the populations of the planet rising up and doing what mature adults should be doing to these kinds of societal problems, instead we do the opposite, right? And I, you know, the vast, like I said, the vast majority of people will absolutely agree that the Vatican controls and has power of a lot more than they really should. Right? And it doesn't matter the person's religion, race, country, whatever. Most people are going to see that for what it is, and, and they're, they're going to know it's there. But isn't it interesting that the vast majority of people will acknowledge that this is a problem, but they won't do anything about it? Right? It's like the militant atheist problem. Militant atheists have no problem attacking religion, only certain religions, but they will never go out of their way to truly disassemble the power structure physically. Right? And, and, and why don't they do this? I mean, they could right now, all the atheists of the world, right now, you could all march on the Vatican and tear it down and start fresh. You could do that. You could make that attempt, and you'd probably be successful to one degree or another. Or at the very least, you would shake things up. But nobody does that, right? Nobody goes over to these companies either, these companies who exercise unbelievably amounts of just oppression over the populations of their host countries. Nobody stops them. Why is this? We can identify it for a scientific fact that all of these institutions are bad, but nobody does anything about it. And yeah, I'm right here. I'm in the same boat as you, by the way. I am not saying I am holier than thou to anybody. I am in the exact same boat. But what is this boat? Why is it that the populations aren't doing anything? Why is it that the populations of the world will allow themselves to be exploited? Or even worse, they will allow their children to be exploited by these institutions and yet they will never raise a finger to stop it. And there's a very simple answer to this question, and that is they have obtained an incredible amount of psychological control over the world's population. And it's that simple. I mean, that's it, okay? I mean, and we're not going to go any further with this. That's, you know, a whole 8 million other shows. Anyway, I just wanted to set the stage for what we're going to talk about and just make sure that everybody here understands that we do indeed have a legitimate problem in society. And it is these kinds of organizations, right? And, and this is not to be taken lightly. This is the kind of stuff that... <laughs> In all honesty, it's probably the most dangerous thing that's going on right now in your, in your family's life. And the fact that nobody does anything about it is very, very interesting. Okay, so anyway, you get my point. So, this begs the question, how did this happen? 
Now, you have to remember, one of the reasons why these people have so much power is because they have been around for a long time, relatively speaking, right? And I mean, you know, obviously there's some companies that have not been around that long, but have gained tremendous amounts of power in a very short period of time. But what I want to focus on is the deep-seated power structure that has been created around the Vatican. And it begs the question, how did we get to this point to where a religious institution is able to control not just, you know, governments and general population, but they also tend to control a lot of historical knowledge as well. And this is key, and this is where we are going to step into the story. How is it that we are allowing a religious institution to control the historical narrative of not just their religion, but also of other religions and then other cultures, histories as well. This is where we're at. And of course, when we're talking about the Vatican, we would be referencing something like the Vatican Library, right? We know for a fact that the Vatican has control over all kinds of historical books and all kinds of historical documents and, and everything, right? They, I, don't, I don't think there's probably a single real historian that would not kill to get in there with unfettered access. Could you imagine what's in those vaults? I mean, can you imagine the ancient texts that that library has recovered and stored deep in their vaults? I mean, it's insane. And we know this for a fact. We know for a fact that the Vatican does indeed possess all of this information. The sad part is, of course, is that they don't allow people to access probably even a fraction of it. And the reality is, all of that information that the Vatican is currently hoarding, that's, I mean, that really should just be open to every single human being on this planet, and it's not. And that really should beg another question, why not? I mean, if these are just, you know, old books, old tomes, old records, you know, whatever, you know, hundreds if not thousands of years old, why would they care? Like, why would this institution go out of its way to not only hoard this knowledge, but then also lock it down so that nobody else can get into it and maybe make some new discoveries, which would generally help humanity. Like, why is this not happening? And the answer is extraordinarily simple. It's because the Vatican is just trying to maintain and keep its current power. That's all there is to it. And you guys all know this. You guys understand. I know, I'm just kind of like repeating myself on stuff that everybody already knows. But to set the stage about the seriousness of the topic that we are going to discuss, you, we got to say it. We, we really have to make sure that everybody understands that the stuff that we're talking about here is not some sort of crazy conspiracy theory. This is not some sort of, you know, crack house, whack job idea to where you're down there, you know, you're hitting like five crack pipes and then everybody comes over with more crack pipes and you just keep smoking it. And then you're like, you know what, bro? I think I just had an epiphany. I think the Vatican is like making this crazy conspiracy to control us all. And you're like, yeah, you're crazy, bro. That's insane because it's not insane, right? There's nothing crazy about it. You can scientifically prove what's going on right now using just basic evidence in front of you. It's not complicated. All right, so now that we have established that there is a religious institution with a tremendous amount of control over the entire planet that you are not immune from, no one, no, blah, 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 blah. nobody is immune from this stuff, right? Like I said earlier, it doesn't matter if you're a hardcore atheist, you have accepted psychological programming from the Vatican, and there's nothing else you can do about it. I mean, well, there's something we can do about it. We can identify that we have the programming, and then we can try to, you know, integrate and break out of it. But you know, that's well, that's a whole other show that you know we we can't we probably can't do that anyway. Okay, anyway, so it begs the ultimate question, though: Where did the Vatican obtain all this power? And as a side question, why did people allow it? I mean, you would, you would think that if there is an institution trying to control you and it's, you know, objectively bad, you would fight against it, right? So how, how is it that these people were able to obtain the level of control they were able to gain, All right? And so this is what we're going to discuss today because there's a couple of interesting things to go over. Now, the first part of this question might sound simple to answer. How did the Vatican gain the control that it gained? 
you can really give a general blanket statement and just say, hey, look, you know, these people brainwashed a bunch of other people using a religious doctrine. And then, of course, all of the people who are brainwashed by religious doctrine then propped up the church and then the rest is history. And that's not necessarily wrong because that is to a degree exactly what happened. The problem with giving that answer and then walking away is that you have given a, a half answer. You have only really addressed a small aspect of what has truly happened to that society that allowed that institution to grow as large as it did. So this is the kind of stuff I wanna get into and go over some of the details. Now it gets even crazier. We're going to talk about some of the details on how this was achieved. And for you smart asses out there right now, I know all of you are saying, yeah, it's the donation of Constantine. It's very simple, it's done. Yeah, okay, we're gonna talk about that. Because a lot of historians and a lot of biblical scholars and all this stuff, whatever, a lot of people do not take into account chronology. The vast majority of historians, it, which is hilarious, they, they don't want anything to do with chronology. They don't want anything to do with a field of science that completely changes the dates of everything they thought they knew. Once we start to apply the science of chronology against all of the other historical data that we are going to bring up, a completely different picture of humanity's history starts to emerge. And I know, you know, I know a lot of people don't care about religious stuff, but I have to be honest with everybody. And I'm not religious, by the way. I'm not, you know, I don't believe in a God. There's none of this. I am not trying to convert anybody to anything. I'm just, you know, the thing that sucks, let me, let me just do a side note here real quick. I know I keep doing like eight, this whole show is like 10 side notes. Anyway, the, the reason why we have to look at religion when we try to study history is because even if the religion itself is not true, right? Like every word of the Bible is 100% fiction. That doesn't matter. It's still a historical document that somebody created back during some period of time in history. And so I know that especially atheists, you know, they like to write off any really religious text at all as being completely useless when it comes to understanding our true human history, but you can't do that. You have to break through that particular psychological barrier that you have created for yourself or that has been built up in you by other kinds of psychological programming. You've got to tear that wall down and be able to analyze. Well, I mean, you need to be able to analyze any subject objectively. I don't care what it is. If you're not capable of doing that, if you're not able to say, look at the Bible, for example, look at it, analyze it, apply science and critical thinking to it, and then just move on with life. If you can't do that for the sole reason that you are you know, heavily against religion, you are at an extraordinary disadvantage. And by, when I say you, I'm not talking about anybody specifically. I should be saying like they or something or people. You get my point though. Like this is something that you have to pay attention to. You can't just ignore all these religious texts because the reality is at the very least, these texts are an insight into people's thoughts and their patterns of, of thinking. And it's also an insight into what was important to them. It's an insight into what they knew about at the time. It's an insight into what they thought they could, you know, write and get away with as potentially fact. I mean, anyway, it, it's, it all matters. When it comes to history, everything matters. So just keep that in mind. All right, but anyway, aside from all of that, aside from the concept of maybe God being real or anything like that, we know for a fact that the Vatican has a lot of pull, you know, with, with the planet's population through various means of control. But how did they gain this control and then how did they maintain it? And then of course, how did they build it up? So what has happened in the past four, five, six, maybe even seven centuries, what has happened is that, you know, people who were objective historians, people who were looking for the truth throughout these last few centuries, what they started to notice was that quite a lot of history appears to be manufactured. So these historians, or more to the point chronologists, started to call this stuff out, right? They started to write books about this. They started to really dive into the science and try and figure out if all of these texts that were appearing during the Renaissance period, or, or really starting from the 1200s-ish period on to about the 1800s-ish, 
what these real historians were starting to notice was is that there were all of these texts that filled in perfect gaps in history that were starting to appear anytime a gap needed to be filled. So what was going on all of a sudden was, you know, humans apparently did not really have a good grasp on their history, which is fascinating in and of itself, by the way. The fact that human history doesn't start to be really recorded and written down en masse until around, you know, starting in the 1200s on up is very weird. Because you would think that humans, even before that, would have been going out of their way to do a much better job in preserving history. Right? And I know there's there's other aspects that destroys history, right? We have the second law of thermodynamics, can't get away from that. You know, we have bad faith actors, people burning stuff, destroying stuff. Yeah, there's a lot of things that can destroy history, and I get that. But it's really weird that when we start looking at how the, the early Middle Age people approach history, uh, it, it's almost like there's there's none there. It's almost like they, they don't really have a good grasp on what was going on before their time period, period even only a few hundred years before them. Right? This was like, this was a legitimate problem. And because there were so many gaps in history for some weird reason, and we'll talk about that on a different show, but it's something to think about, by the way, but because there were so many gaps that could be filled, all of a sudden we found ourselves in a situation to where texts were magically appearing that filled those gaps. And to make it even more interesting, the texts that started appearing, especially during the Renaissance period, always seemed to favor certain kinds of power structures. Suddenly they were starting to allow mm, certain bloodlines or certain authorities to gain even more power than perhaps they already had. Right, and this, right here, right, right, the second I said that, everybody should now be extremely suspicious of every single text that appears during this period of time. Now, one of the things that starts to magically appear right in the nick of time is all of a sudden we have all of these texts that start to legitimize the current church that created the Vatican. So this is, this is pretty lucky, right? That all of a sudden, no, nobody had any idea about any of these texts. And then all of a sudden, right when they really needed them to prove their authority, they magically appear, right? So this is a problem, okay? This is the issue. Now, what was going on, and this is a fact, during the Renaissance period of time, during, you know, the, this 1200 to 17, 1800 period of time, the reality was is that forgeries had become a literal industry. And, and there's no way around this. This is also a scientific fact. And there's no way around this. We know for a fact that forgeries became an industry. So it really begs the question, when we find a situation to where mainstream academia is citing and sourcing all of these texts that appear during this time period, and we also know that there was a huge forgery industry going, it, it kind of makes you wonder like, well, how much of the stuff right now is the mainstream, you know, over there, you know, shouting as fact, how much of that stuff is just absolute garbage and lies, right? It, it gets weird. Now, with respect to the whole papacy Vatican situation, these guys did the exact same thing that everybody else was doing. They also employed the forgers to come up with the documentation required for them to take over certain parts of the country. This is what happened. Now, it gets even weirder than that, right? And right now you're like, oh, okay, well, makes sense, right? Okay, somebody forged some stuff in the nick of time. Those forgeries were then used to take over and blah, 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 and we go from there. This makes sense and it sounds logical. However, it gets even weirder. Now, a lot of people who are trying to do real history, this is probably as far as they will get. They will admit, yes, you know, the Constantine forgery is real. You know, all the other forgeries that were also used, those were real forgeries. And yes, the papacy exploited those forgeries to gain their power. And, and they would wipe their hands of it and they would move on, right? Because that does make sense. That seems like that would line up with human psychology. That seems to line up with history very well. And, and it seems to line up with the corrupt situation we find ourselves in. It, it, it all adds up, right? And, and so I give credit to those people. However, it gets even weirder. What if the donation of Constantine is not a forged document? What if instead 
that document was not written by Constantine in the 4th century AD, but what if it was instead written and composed in the 13th century AD? What if Constantine did not live way back in the day? What if Constantine existed around the 13th century? Right? That, that is, that, that's a completely different picture, right? But the interesting thing is there is science that proves that this might be the case. Now, what I want to do in today's show, I'm going to read a little snippet from Anno Domini, this book by Laurent Gaillon. Gaillonot. I can't speak French, right? What do you want from me? I suck at languages. Um, but anyways, Anno Domini. It's called A Short History of the First Millennium A.D. This was a great book. I highly recommend it if you guys are interested in looking at real history from a scientific perspective. Um, and, and it's also cool because this guy uses Gunnar Heinsohn for some of his stuff. Gunnar Heinsohn is a brilliant dude, right? That just absolutely insane. Changed my life as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, okay. So I want to read some out of this book to lay down the foundation for everybody understanding two things. It's possible that the donation of Constantine is not a forgery. And also to get a basic understanding of how forgeries still did play a role in all of this, but maybe not necessarily in the time period that you're thinking. The, everything is so scrambled up nowadays in history, it's insane. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read these few pages to you guys to give you a, a backbone of this so that you can see that the way history is taught in the mainstream is obviously wrong. We know that. But even in the alternative research community, I'm going to say the mainstream alternative research community, even the, those guys are nowhere near touching this depth of what may have happened back in history. Now, it's really important to remember when I start reading this, a lot of this stuff is based on, you know, A, it's based on good scholarship, but B, it's also based on science. And that's the important part here. All right, I'm talking enough. Let's get into this book. This section is called The Papal Forgery Factory. Arguably the most distinctive feature of the early Christian literature is the degree to which it was forged. Throughout the first four centuries AD, forgery was the rule in Christian literature and genuine authorship the exception. Forgery was so systemic that forgeries gave rise to counter forgeries, that is, forgeries used to counter the views of other forgeries. If forgery is part of the DNA of Christianity, we can expect it to persist throughout the Middle Ages. The German specialist of medieval diploma, Harry Breslau, estimated that almost 50% of documents from the Merovingian period were forgeries. He concludes, quote, It is undeniable that even the most eminent men of the church, clergymen whose piety and virtuous conduct are highly praised, have resorted to theft and lying to come into possession of venerated and miraculous relics, even that they resorted to falsification and fraud when it came to increasing or defending the property, rights, and reputation of their churches. Often entire series of acts have been fabricated for such purposes." End quote. That's the kind of statement right there that you are never going to hear from a mainstream historian. Right? And, and there's tons of people out here, by the way, who have been studying these forgeries and have been calling them out. The only problem and the reason why you probably have not heard of any of these people is because the, the well, to be honest, the mainstream institutions have gone out of their way to shut them up, right? Because you start talking like this, 50% of the documents used. This is from a mainstream historian, by the way. They're willing to say that 50% of them are forgeries. That's, you know, it's just crazy. How the hell can you build a reliable history from a time period that we know for a fact has tons of forgeries? Okay, okay, now I'm getting pissed, okay. The most famous medieval forgeries is the donation of Constantine. 
By this document, Emperor Constantine is supposed to have transferred his own authority over the Western religions of the Empire of Pope Sylvester. This forgery of outrageous audacity is included in a collection of about a hundred counterfeit decrees and acts of synods attributed to the earliest popes or other church dignitaries, and known today as the Pseudo-Isodorian Decretals, whose aim was to set forth precedents for the exercise of sovereign authority of the Bishop of Rome over the Universal Church. These forgeries did not exercise any major influence on the legal tradition until the 11th century. And it is not before the 12th century that they were incorporated by Gratian into his Decretum, which became the basis of all canon law. Yet the scholarly consensus is that they date back from the time of Charlemagne. For that reason, Professor Horst Furman, president of Monumenta Germanae Historica, classifies them as forgeries with the anticipatory character. Quote, Sylvester legend, Constantine donation, Symmachian forgeries, pseudo-Clemens letters, pseudo-Isidorian forgeries, let us stop at that list. All these forgeries have the characteristic that at the time they were written, they had hardly any effect. At the time of their creation, they had an anticipatory character." Unquote. According to him, these fakes had to wait, depending on the case, between 250 and 550 years before being used. Herbert Illig and Hans Ulrich Niemitz have protested against this theory of forgeries allegedly written by clerics who had no use of them and did not know what purpose their forgeries could serve centuries later. Forgeries are produced to serve a project, and they are made on demand when needed. Therefore, these forgeries are wrongly dated. Their anticipatory character as an illusion created by one of the chronological distortions that we have set out to correct. The donation of Constantine must date from the 10th century, huh, okay, when it first came into use. The first attested legal document where it is mentioned is the Ottonian privilege issued by Otto the Great on February 3rd, 962, after his coronation by Pope John XII. This document grants the Pope a long list of domains, including the city of Rome with its duchy, the entire exostrate of Ravenna, as well as Venetia, Corsica, and Sicily. It mentions the donation of Constantine, but also a donation made by Pepin, King of the Franks, to Pope Stephen II, later confirmed by Pepin's son Charlemagne to Pope Sylvester II. So the donation of Constantine is the basis for the donation of Pepin, supposedly confirmed by Charlemagne, which is the basis for the Autonian privilege. How do you like that? You like all that crap? Yeah, it's great. This is how they confuse everybody. This is exactly how it's done. Doubts have always hung over the existence of the donation of Pepin, because no authentic act is known nor is Charlemagne's confirmation attested to by any legal diploma. As a side note, it's entirely possible, actually, that Charlemagne never existed. Yeah, how do you like that one? Charlemagne might literally just be a phantom character created further on in history and then sent back in time. Yeah, that, that's a whole other problem, too, with all of these donations. Okay, anyway, it is most probable that the donation of Constantine and the donation of Pepin were both fabricated during the same period, 
as an inextricable legal miss on a BM. I don't know what that means. A miss on a BM. I don't know. In fact, there is no confirmation that the Atonian privilege itself, whose original is jealously kept in the Vatican archives, is not itself a forgery. <laughs> Very interesting. Okay. Other false decretals probably date from the early stages of the Gregorian reform, which started with the ascension of Pope Leo IX in 1049. The Gregorian reform was a continuation of the monastic revival launched by the powerful Benedictine Abbey of Cluny, which a century after its foundation in 910 had developed a network of more than a thousand monasteries all over Europe. The Gregorian reform can be conceived as a monkish coup over Europe, in the sense that celibate monks who used to live at the margin of society progressively took the leadership. Yeah, we saw that happen, right? Through, through the use of some of these documents. Yeah. It is worth insisting on the revolutionary character of the Gregorian reform. It was, wrote Mark Bloch of Feudal Society, quote, an extraordinarily powerful movement from which, without exaggeration, may be dated the definite formation of Latin Christianity, unquote. More recently, Robert Moore wrote in The First European Revolution, 970 to 1215, quote, the reform which was embodied in the Gregorian program was nothing less than a project to divide the world, both people and property, into two distinct autonomous realms, not geographically, but socially, unquote. That's one hell of a conclusion, right? Just by looking at the historical documentation and the way that these forgeries worked out, you can literally deduce that this organization was doing one thing and one thing only, gaining power by dividing and conquering, right? And it's right there, right in front of everybody. God, it just boggles the mind that historians can look at this stuff and they can see right in front of them what is being done and historians nowadays, you know, including us, we have the benefit from seeing the results of what happened when all of this was put into play. And as we look around, it's, it's worked its magic perfectly, right? The divide and conquer strategy, it's alive and well. And that's, that's absolutely what is destroying society. So what's going on basically is that the church in this particular, you know, what they did is they split everybody up made sure that they would fight amongst themselves, so ultimately nobody would go after the church who was the main central cause of that particular divide and conquer strategy. I mean, what do you want? It's just crazy, right? We know what the problems are. We can literally scientifically point out what the problems are in society and nobody does anything. Like everybody just keeps going. It's absolutely insane. Right, the best kind of slave is the slave that pays for their chains. That's exactly what the world's doing right now. It's just absolutely insane. Okay, anyway. The reform triumphed at the Fourth Lateran Council convened by Innocent III in 1215. The world created by Lateran IV was an entirely different world. A world pervaded and increasingly molded by the well-drilled piety and obedience associated with the traditional vision of the Age of Faith, or medieval Christianity. Yet, in a sense, Lateran IV was only a beginning. In 1234, Innocent III's cousin Gregory IX instituted the Inquisition, but the great period of witch hunting, the last battle against paganism, was still two centuries away. In his book, Law and Revolution, The Formation of the Western Legal Tradition, Harold Berman also insists on the revolutionary character of the Gregorian reform, by which, quote, the clergy became the first trans-local, trans-tribal, trans-feudal, transitional class in Europe 
to achieve political and legal unity, unquote. To speak of revolution, change within the Church of Rome is, of course, to challenge the Orthodox. Oh, that's actually a really good point. Huh, I never thought about that. If you challenge the church, you would essentially be challenging the Bible. And if you're, you know, if you're convinced that stuff is real, you're not allowed to do that. Which then gives them, the them being, you know, the Pope and all those guys, really good control over your average person psychologically because they've been trained to not go against the Bible. Oh my God, it's crazy. Where was I? All right. Yeah, I stopped mid-sentence. All right, so to speak of a revolutionary change within the Church of Rome is, of course to challenge the Orthodox, though not the Eastern Orthodox view that the structure of the Roman Catholic Church is the result of a gradual elaboration of elements that had been present from very early times. This was, indeed, the official view of the Catholic reformers of the late 11th and early 12th centuries. They were only going back, they said, to an earlier tradition that had been betrayed by their immediate predecessors. The reformers, in other words, established a new world order under the pretense of restoring an ancient world order. They invented a past in order to control the future. That, there it is. I mean, that's key. That, that is exactly what is going on everywhere with respect to historical research. I mean, that, that is exactly what has happened. All of these institutions, what they have done is they have forged all of these documents, all of this supposed proof that allows them to get into and then maintain these unbelievable power structures. And people just went along with it. I'm not saying everybody did, right? I mean, there, there were plenty of people that pushed back. Let me make sure that I give credit to the people in the past that actually did fight back because they existed, right? They were there. Uh, but the reality is a lot of their work was simply pushed to the side or outright destroyed by these power structures. I mean, a great example is Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton did more work on chronology than he did on his theory of gravity. How do you like that? I mean, there's, everybody believe, everybody knows that Isaac Newton was a really smart dude, but of course he's insane when he questions history. How do you like that? I mean, it's, just, it's, in, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. You can't do that. You cannot like, you cannot praise a dude for one completely amazing thing that he's done and then completely ignore the other thing for no other reason than somebody from an authoritative position told you to do it. You just, you just can't do that, right? I mean, there were a lot of people back in the day calling this out, but they have been marginalized. I mean, even somebody like Isaac Newton was literally pushed to the side when he did his work. I mean, that, that's the depth of how corrupt everything is. Like, what? All right, you got all right. Let's keep going. For that, they employed an army of jurists who elaborated a new canonical legal system to supersede customary feudal laws. And they made their new legal system appear as the oldest by producing forgeries on a massive scale. Besides the pseudo Isidorian decretals, and the false donation of Constantine, they crafted the Samachian forgeries, destined to produce legal precedents to make the Pope immune from legal condemnation or trial. I mean, come on, man. How is that ever allowed by anybody? I mean, that's like you just really quickly creating an email and just backdating dating it to like, I don't know, 1737 and being like, see, I don't know, some guy back in 1373, you know, they said that I was immune from all of this stuff. And since it's old, it has to be true. And that means you can't arrest me. You know, it's, it's just like, what are you talking about? It's the dumbest stuff you can imagine. But the population had already been beaten down psychologically to a very specific point to where you could introduce this kind of doctrine and get away with it. Right? That, that's how this stuff works. This is not new. You know, psychologically destroying people is not new. This stuff has been around forever. But that's the environment that these guys created to get away with this stuff. You know, here we are producing an old document that says you can't arrest me. And then people are like, yeah, okay, cool. It's just absolutely, okay. 
One of these documents, the Silver Street Constitutum, makes up from the donation takes of takes takes takes. One of these documents, the Silvestri Constitutum, takes up from the donation of Constantine the legend of Pope Sylvester I curing Constantine the Great of leprosy with the waters of baptism and receiving in gratitude Constantine's imperial insignia and the city of Rome. You know, it's like basically you do, you're just chilling at your house and if somebody, it's, this is what it's like, right? You're hanging out at your house, you, you know, you're smoking crack, whatever, doesn't matter, you're having fun, you know, scratching yourself, whatever, doesn't matter. And then all of a sudden your doorbell rings and some dude's sitting out there and he says, hey, look, I've got this document from uh, 800 BC that says your house is mine, so you have to get out. And then you're like, oh yeah, my bad, bro. Here you go. Thank you for showing me this random document that just kicked me out of my house. You know, nobody does that, right? That you would not, uh, hopefully you would not do that. Hopefully you would slam the door in that dude's face or you would jump out the window, come around back and start just arm barring him, grab him and just start choking him. Like, <laughs> would you say, you said, to <laughs> you know, just then you grab him by the hair and then you climb up to your roof and then you throw him off the roof and he splats on the ground and then you jump off the roof and they do an elbow right into his back and then you start choking. Charlemagne's father was also made to contribute with the false donation of Pepin. It is now admitted that the vast majority of legal documents supposedly established before the 9th century are clerical forgeries. According to the French historian Laurent Morel, quote, two-thirds of the acts entitled in the name of the Merovingian kings have been identified as false or falsified." Unquote. It is very likely that the real proportion is much higher, and that many documents which are still deemed authentic are forgeries. For example, it is our view, this guy is in the book, view, not my view, his view, Maybe sort of my view, I don't know. For example, it is our view that the wording on the foundation charter of the Abbey of Cluny, by which its founder William I renounced all control over it, cannot possibly have been dictated or endorsed by a medieval duke. These forged documents serve the popes on several fronts. They were used in their power struggle against the German emperors as a justification for their extravagant claim that the Pope could depose emperors. This is insane, right? The amount of power that this stuff gives these guys. It's just mind-blowing. And people went with it. Gosh, okay. They were also powerful weapons in the geopolitical war waged against the Byzantine church and empire. By bestowing on the papacy supremacy over the four principal sees, Alexandria, Antioch, Jerusalem, and Constantinople, as also over all the churches of God in the whole earth, the false donation of Constantine justified Rome's claim for precedence over Constantinople which led to the Great Schism of 1054, and ultimately the sack of Constantinople by the Latins in 1204. By a cruel irony, the spuriousness of the donation of Constantine was exposed in 1430, after, and this is key, after it had served its purpose. By then, the Eastern Empire had lost all of its territories and was reduced to a depopulated city besieged by the Ottomans. Byzantium and by extension Constantinople, you know, whatever you want to call it, that city's history is really weird and it seems like it's actually pretty unfortunate. You know, it's funny, as a side note, there's actually really good scholarship that is pointing towards Constantinople being the original Jerusalem. How do you like that? It, it gets crazy, man. When you start, ugh, man, we have a lot to cover in the future of this channel before it gets banned forever, and then I can go back to having a normal life. Okay, where the hell was I? Last paragraph of this section. It is little known, but of great importance for understanding medieval times when ethnicity played a major role in politics. 
that the Gregorian reformers were Franks, even before Bruno of the Egesheim Dagsburg gave the first impulse as Pope Leo IX. That is why Orthodox theologian John Romides blames the Franks for having destroyed the unity of Christendom with ethnic and geopolitical motivations. Huh. In Byzantine chronicles, Latin and Frank are synonymous. That is actually really important, and I'm glad he brings that up, because the Frankish, the Franco, you know, situation down in that area, that may actually be all the real history that happened with respect to what we consider ancient Rome, or, or even ancient Greece in some respects, or a lot of respects. That's where chronology really starts to shine the light on the truth. Um, anyway, we're not going to get into the Frank stuff like that, but just know that that's important. That a lot of the, the history that we, that we know right now comes from this period of time. What's even more interesting is that a lot of that history seems to have actually maybe happened during like the Renaissance period between 1200, you know, not just the Renaissance, but between like the 1200 and 1700s. Um, but then those events are then copy and pasted and they're thrown back a thousand years or 2000 years or whatever. There's a lot of that in this area. You know, it's funny, the entire area over there, the Mediterranean area, the area around Constantinople, you know, the, the whole, that whole geological area, Northern Africa, some of Europe, eh, all of Europe, I guess you could say, you know, Asia Minor. Anyway, there's, there's all this really weird centralized stuff going on specifically there for some weird reason. And, and that kind of, that area becomes like the, the neural network of forgeries that, you know, will spread across the entire planet over time. Now, I know there's a mainstream political movement right now that sits there and blames, oh yeah, it's all Europeans that did everything. You have to remember, there were all kinds of people coming in and out of this area for all kinds of reasons, right? Trade, just moving, migrating, etc. There was all kinds of crazy stuff going on. And in fact, it gets even weirder because what may have driven so many cultures towards this area may have actually been because uh, a catastrophe had actually happened there relatively recently and people were trying to flood back in to gain what they could because they knew certain areas of the planet had been wiped clean. That's a different subject for a different time, but it's very interesting to think about when you start to piece together chronology, you start to look at the real geology, the artifacts, you know, everything. It, it gets insane, and it really starts to shed a real light on why we find such a weird cultural, you know, conglomeration of people in this particular area, right, at, at this very particular time. It's really not a coincidence to find what we ultimately find. It just sucks that what happens happens, right? I mean, it, it's just unfortunate that when we get to this period in history and in that area, you know, geologically or geographically, I guess both are true. You know, unfortunately, we really do find a situation to where all kinds of political people are vying for power in these areas and the amount of garbage that is created to substantiate these power grabs. You know, it's just legion. It's all over the place. And this is what, this is the problem with mainstream history, right? I mean, everything we just read is backed up by actual real scholarship. In fact, a lot of the scholarship that, you know, is defending a lot of what we just read is also sort of mainstream scholarship. It's, you know, uh, the fact that we have the problems that we have in history right now is a living testament to how unbelievably psychologically conditioned everybody on this planet is to ignore the truth. And that's exactly what is happening, right? It's almost impossible to look at any of these histories nowadays and, and try to make a discovery or try to point at the evidence that proves something else happened because the mainstream will be on top of you in a second. You are not allowed to have a dissenting opinion when it comes to any of this stuff. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to read from like a book. It's because it's not just me being a schizo. There's legitimately really intelligent people out there doing really good work. And the chances are you have probably never heard them, heard of them ever, right? Because ugh. Anyway, so anyway, this guy's book, Anno Domini, Laurent Guyano. I'm totally destroying his name. 
I apologize. You know, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not good. It's, you know, I got problems. Okay. Uh, you know what? Also, it's funny. We need to talk about this. I won't do it now because we're at, we're at like an hour, I think, right now. We, we've gone on long enough. But another thing that is mentioned in this particular section is the Gregorian reform. There's actually a lot of really bad stuff that goes down with this particular reformation. I don't think a lot of people truly understand what happened with the Gregorian reform, how it was created, and ultimately what it was used for. Uh, I won't get into that now because we're done. I'll let you go. I'll give you your life back. But it's it's just something to think about. When, it, when you see the Gregorian reform, when you see that topic, keep an open mind and just remember that there were absolutely malicious actors involved in that reformation and they were not looking to make your life or anybody else's lives better, right? They were looking to make their own life better or they were only looking to grab power. When you start to look at the Gregorian reform in that context, a lot of things will change. You are gonna have to sift through a lot of mainstream garbage and I know that part is tough. Just keep an open mind and we'll, we'll talk about the Gregorian reform later, right? I promise, okay. Okay, go, go live life, I'm done, I'm finished, I keep talking. I gotta shut the fuck up, I, shut up. <laughs>